Good evening. We're back. I hope you all had a good supper and you're uh, you're awake and not too sleepy after two delicious meals. Um, if your neighbor starts to fall asleep, you have my permission to uh, smack them in Christian love and wake them back up. So there, it's been a long day, and uh, you're already been twelve. You're already in the elbow twice. I guess she was wanting you to listen. The uh, uh, so we are going to be talking about uh, calibrating with fasting, and. Um, you know, I've had several people say the same thing to me today, knowing when we're going to talk about fasting tonight, and that is, you know, not a lot of people talk about fasting. Um, when's the last time you heard a sermon on fasting? Uh, uh, when's, the, when's the last time that you fasted? When's the last time your church as a church fasted? When's the last, you know, think about that. So fasting, uh, um, you could probably, the, the, the last time you fast fooded was probably pretty recent, but the <laughs> fasting, not so much. Uh, so um, I want to encourage you to not miss out on the blessing of fasting because you think it's hard or it's difficult or it sounds unpleasant or that doesn't sound like fun to me to miss meals. Um, there's lots of things that don't seem like they're going to be a blessing till you do them and then you realize what a blessing they are like visiting folks in the nursing home or eating healthy or uh or regularly exercising doesn't sound like a lot of fun until you start regularly doing it and incorporate it and it becomes part of your life um i've never been a long distance runner so i don't know about a runner's high but i used to do a lot of bicycling um in fact after i was out of college my day job while I was traveling, preaching, and singing as a young man was to deliver packages on a bicycle in downtown Cincinnati. I was a bike courier, and I would do about 50 miles a day. I would average about 50 miles a day on a bicycle, up and down the hills of Cincinnati, up and down Mount Adams, up, you know, all, all over everywhere. And, uh, and it was, a, it was an, you know, across the bridge to northern Kentucky. It was an entertaining, interesting, and exciting job. Um, but when you ride a lot at first, it's very painful, it's very hard, and there was a lot of muscle aches. And I remember Cameron, who was my trainer, you know, he saw me eating lunch off the hot dog carts and going to the Skyline Chili every day, and I complained of all the muscle burn. And he says, well, you're putting all that junk in there. He's like, he's like, if you would eat different, you would have a different experience. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he says, I eat three or four bananas a day. Because you need potassium to deal with getting rid of the muscle burn. And then he says, I eat an apple, and I, may, I eat a, maybe a sandwich or something that's healthy for lunch. So I pack my lunch, it saves me money, and, and I'm not putting all those nitrates and all that junk in my body, and, and I don't get the muscle burn as much. And I thought, I just kind of, he's like, and drink a ton of water. Like he said, you have that bottle of water, and so he says, you need to drink about four of those, five of those a day. So I started refilling the water bottle. I started eating two bananas before I went to work. And I would, uh, I stopped eating at the hot dog stands at the Skyline, and I started packing a turkey sandwich and an apple and another banana for lunch. And then at night, he says, at night, that's when you carb up. He says, you need the energy for the next day, but your body needs time to process it. He says, you eat your carbs at night. You carb up pasta, 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 because you need energy to go. We're doing 50 miles a day. You don't need to worry about calories. You need to worry about carbs. So I, I would eat... <laughs> spaghetti and all kinds of stuff like the lasagna and my, you know all that for and then in the day I would eat I would eat in the morning I would eat that healthy food and I'm telling you all the muscle burn went away and then I got to riding normal and you got used to it and then pretty soon it was enjoyable and I remember riding up what used to be like oh, I'm dying riding up you know about it and I'm like enjoying it it feels good it's like mm, it's like when you get if you lift weights you get that pump like Arnold Schwarzenegger Arnold Schwarzenegger always talked about it gets the pump, you know, and it gets you a barn and it feels so good, you know, whatever. I can't do it a good Arnold. But uh, <laughs> that, that feeling, and I think it's like a runner's high. I think that's like what a runner's high is. And there, when, as I have fasted, I've learned to fast. I've learned at first it can be very difficult, but once I'm into a fast, it's not that hard. Like, I've fasted for a week before. And you think, well, that would be, how do you go a whole week without food? It actually, after like day two and a half, three, it's like I don't even notice. I don't even miss the food anymore. And, and the spiritual benefits and some of the other benefits 
of fasting are really good. Now, today there's intermittent fasting and there's fasting for health reasons. And those are all legit, but that's not what we're talking about. I'm not talking about fasting for physical reasons, though there are some physical benefits to fasting. I'm not ta- we're not going to be talking about fasting from your favorite thing, though there might be some benefits to that. Or fasting from, sh- I'm on a sugar fast. Okay, for health reasons, I can see a person doing that. I tried that once, went a whole month without sugar. Um, there's physical, but that's not a spiritual, that's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about the spiritual side of fasting, the, the fasting where it's done for spiritual reasons. And f- we're going to talk about what those reasons are biblically, biblical reasons to fast. We're going to talk about the process. But what I want to point out is that fasting, if your health is able, should be a part of your life. And I put that qualifier on there because... Some people do have health issues that should prohibit them from fasting or maybe fasting for a long time or whatever. If you have medical issues, you need to seek a doctor's advice and input before fasting. Because I want to kill somebody encouraging you to fast if you have diabetes or you have a medical something. Although I will say this, some people on diabetes have fasted and got rid of their diabetes, but that's a whole other thing. That's health reasons for fasting. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an expert. I'm not getting into that. So I want to say, uh, put a disclaimer on here for uh, myself and for the school. Uh, I'm, not say, I'm not suggesting if you have health issues that you should fast. It's not for everybody in every situation because, you know, if, if, um, if you're sick with a communicable disease, you shouldn't go to church. Now, normally, everybody should go to church, and going to church is something a Christian could do. I, sh- I can say, you know, every Christian should be going to church, and we, we shouldn't forsake the gathering of ourselves together. The Bible says that. And so I'll give that blanket statement, but I can also put an asterisk on that and say, unless you are got a communicable disease, please don't come get everybody sick. You understand what I'm saying? And so there could be health reasons why you don't obey God's command, but generally speaking, everybody should be going to church. And so I will say with a little asterisk, unless you have health problems, you should be fasting sometimes, if you're a Christian. Every Christian should at times be fasting. So this is for you, unless you have health issues, and then you need to deal with those health issues and get those fixed so you can fast. Uh, And get yourself taken care of so that you can do, uh, and not miss out on this blessing of fasting. Look what it says in Mark 2. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came to Jesus and asked, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but you're not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? They cannot, so as long as he, as long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day, they will fast. When a bridegroom came for the party, the engagement party before wedding, he would come and they'd throw a party and the two would be bound. And back then, engagements were a legal binding thing. If you were engaged but not married, in order to get unengaged, the girl couldn't just go, I'm not marrying you, throw off the ring and say, we're not getting married. You had to go get a divorce because the engagement was a legally binding thing. If you slept with an engaged girl, that was adultery, not just fornication. And... So an engagement was a serious thing. So you'd come, you'd have a party, an engagement party, and get engaged. Then he'd go away and build a house for her to live with and get everything ready. When he was ready for his party, he would come back for bride. Didn't always tell her when he was coming. And it was her job to get ready. So while the bride and the groom are together for their engagement party, they're not fasting. They're partying. They're eating. They're enjoying. But when he goes away, that's when the bride fasts. She's losing weight. She's getting herself ready. She's taking milk baths. She's, you know, she's getting her hair done. She's getting herself all dolled up and prettied up so that when the groom returns, she is babelicious. You know? She's beautiful. If she was president, she'd be Abraham Lincoln. She, was, she just wants to be gorgeous. And that's an analogy for us in the church, right? We were engaged to Christ. 
and we're his church, we're his bride. He's gone away to heaven to prepare a place for us that where he is, we may be also. And someday, surprise, surprise, he's coming back and we need to be ready. Have oil in our lamps and ready to go. We need to keep watch because we don't know what hour of the night he's going to come. And right now is the time to fast, to get ourselves ready so we look good in our wedding dress. Now is the time to prepare our hearts and our minds for that great wedding banquet in the sky. And so we, at that time, didn't fast with Jesus because the bridegroom was scared. But a time is going to come when I go away, and then what's it say? They will fast. So is Jesus gone? Is the bridegroom away? Then Christians should be fasting. All the time? No, not all the time. But there should be moments where Christians fast. Do we see the early Christians fasting? Yes, we do. Do we see fasting of people in the Bible? Yes. So we can learn about what fasting is really about. The problem today is that pagans also fast. But pagan fasting was incorporated into the church over the past couple centuries, where people who were pagan got forced to become Christians or became Christians half-heartedly or took up a form of Christianity that wasn't real Christianity based on the Bible, and they brought their pagan ideas of fasting into the church and their pagan rituals and pagan traditions of fasting that contradict Jesus and the Bible's teaching on fasting. So much of what we think fasting is is actually not biblical fasting, not based on Christian fasting. And in fact, uh, uh, I was, I was going to say it was baptized pagan fasting, but it wasn't even baptized, it was just sprinkled. Um, and, and it was brought into churchianity. And that's where we get things like Lent and the stuff that, you know, Mardi Gras, and we get festival, and we get all these things that happen that have to do with fasting that are nothing to do with Christian fasting or Christianity. And so I want to go through and I want to look at, at biblical fasting, what it's about, and I want to tell you, you should be doing it upon occasion, okay? Why? For you, for your benefit. And if you make fasting a part of your life, after a while, you're going to get what seems like a difficult, hard thing, you're going to find gives you the runner's high. If you do it right, then you're, you're going to find the benefits of it, make it worth it, and something you might even be eager to do and ready to do. Now, um, so what, what, are the, what is the time to fast? When should we fast is our first question. What should we be fasting for? Just any old reason? To demonstrate sorrow. Nehemiah 1.4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before God of heaven. Psalm 69.10. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. One of the times to fast is in a time of sorrow. Some of that's natural. Um, I remember when I went through a divorce, it was a horrible thing, and I lost like 30 pounds in two months. And my good buddy Kirk Hacker didn't know what was going on in my life. In fact, nobody did yet. I hadn't told anybody what was going on in, in my life. And he saw me, and I was just distraught. Some of it was fasting. Some of it was I just couldn't keep food down. I was so heartbroken, so discouraged. So, And he saw me, and he's like, Man, I need to go on the diet you're on. He saw me, how I thought much I loved. And I said, nobody, you don't want to ever go on the diet I'm on. And sometimes the reason we don't eat, the reason we fast and we pray instead of eating, is we got a broken heart. It's sorrow. One of the times to fast is when you are just so distraught. What did Nehemiah hear? He heard that Jerusalem was in ruins. The wall was torn down. The people were in distress on every side. Imagine if there was a war. China attacked us. And you got carted off. You got, parents got captured. You were just young. And you got carted off into captivity. 
made a slave in China, having to work for the CCP government. And your brother comes back to China because he'd been sent on a trip by the Chinese government to come over to America for some reason. And he said, what was it like over there? Everybody is homeless. Everything's destroyed. The Statue of Liberty is in ruins in New York Harbor. The Washington Monument is knocked over. Lincoln Memorial is torn down. The White House, half of it's gone. The Capitol Building Dome is blown in half. Washington is in ruins. The whole country is just decimated. It looks like just war has happened over, and everybody is in distress. There's crime. There's no jobs. There's a totalitarian communist government ruling over people. There's people in work camps. They're in distress. It's terrible. And you love your country. And you think about your people, your country, all the freedom and all the goodness of a country, gone. The beautiful buildings, you know. They blew up Mount Rushmore. You know? They tore, they tore everything down. They've replaced it with all these red banners with Mao's picture everywhere. You'd cry. You'd weep. Right? You'd be like Charlton Heston at the end of Planet of the Apes. Mad. Broken. That's what Nehemiah heard. And before... He ever had a plan to fix it. And he did fix it. But before he could fix it, before he had the courage and the plan and the thought, he sought the Lord. And he fasted. And he prayed. Your relationship's in ruins. Your family's torn apart. Your church is dying in front of your face. Your kids and your grandkids have been decimated by Satan. Things are bad. Things are hard. The news around you in the country and the morality of the people is discouraging. Everything you see on TV is fear and terror or disgusting and gross. What is a man to do when the foundations are destroyed? What Nehemiah did Fast and pray. When it seems hopeless, when you feel helpless, and when your heart is broken, that, if you were wondering, is a time to fast and pray. Why fast? You skip the food because you're focusing on the spiritual. You get hungry. You think, oh, I'm hungry. I'm fasting. What do I do? Do I go eat? No. You go pray. It's like an alarm bell that reminds you to pray. All the time that you would spend eating, pray. All the time you would think about eating, that's a reminder to pray. Well, I'm hungry. My stomach's grumbling. There's an alarm clock telling you to pray that you've got bigger, more important things. The man doesn't live by bread alone. And that for a while, you're going to set that aside and you're going to focus on something more important. You're going to focus on the spiritual. You're going to fast. You're going to pray. When you're in sorrow, when you're being scorned, when you're in distress, there is a time to fast and pray. And Jesus said, when I'm gone, my disciples will pray. And do Christians run into times of sorrow? Oh yeah. And did they fast and pray? Yes, they did. And one of the things that he needed to pray about and that the nation needed to deal with was repentance. There needed to be repentance. Nehemiah, on the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting, wearing sackcloth, having dust on their heads. They were repenting of their sins. 
So not only did Nehemiah pray, at times he got everybody praying. They go back, they rebuild the walls. All right, we've rebuilt the city. Yay, we're back in town. Things are good. Woohoo. And then they get out a copy of the, of the Old Testament law and they read it and they're like, uh-oh. Oh no, we, we haven't done any of this. And they realize their own sin is what put them in that predicament. And when you need to repent, when you find yourself in sin and it's caused trouble and it's messed up your life, and you've got a sin problem, that is a time to fast and pray. You can't quit doing that sin? You keep going back to it? You know, maybe you need to fast and pray. Joel, look at what he says. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments, Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. He relents from sending calamity. I don't know if you realize what's going on. I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I am a historian. And nobody does what our country does and doesn't have a huge crash. Financially, militarily, disease, famine, war, pestilence. The four horsemen are unleashed when you live like this. Every nation, without exception, thinks killing babies is cool. God's going to do something about it. Thinks uh, sexual perversion is fine. Thinks violating covenants and not keeping vows and marriages is okay. God's going to do something. And we are on the precipice, and if you don't smell that one coming, you you know, her nose isn't working. You don't got to be a prophet to read the clouds and know that rain's coming. You get wind from the north, west, you know something's about to go down. Right? When there's a ring around the moon, it's going to rain. Red sky in the morning, sailor, take warning. And when the nation turns from the Lord, the hammer is about to be dropped. But if now, if even now, God's people, not the whole country, just the Christians in this country, would pray and fast and repent and turn from their sins and turn back to God, He would relent in sending calamity. All Sodom and Gomorrah had to do is come up with ten good, godly people to stop the the fire and brimstone, and they couldn't find three. Well, I found four, but one of them turned to salt. Repentance is a time to fast and pray. When everything is a mess and sin is dominant, that is a time for the church to fast and pray. If your church needs to repent, then your church needs to call for some fasting and some praying. If you need to repent, you need to fast and to pray. Fasting should be a part of our life. A part of being a Christian. A part of the bride's life when the groom is gone. When to demonstrate repentance. And, it, and if we do it, even now, even now, even at this last hour, even at this late moment, even at this desperate time, even when the country has gone from 90% of the people going to church every week to 10% or less of people going to church every week, even though we flip-flop that statistics, even now, if we'd repent, he would relent. But there needs to be some fasting, some praying, some crying, some sorrow, some weeping, some wailing, some begging, and some pleading. 
and some change in some behavior. We need a revival, not one where we sing a bunch of songs for 48 hours, but where we change our evil ways. Real repentance, not emotional feels, not, not the release of you know, endorphins from music, but the rejection of sin and rebellion to God and a humility of falling before him in prayer and fasting. And begging for him to deliver. That's revival. In times of distress, Esther, when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. He went only as far as the king's gate because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. You couldn't go into the presence of the king upset or mourning. In every province in which the edict order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When there's distress and it's, there is danger on every side and it doesn't seem like there's a way out, this is when you fast and pray. When do you fast and pray? In times of distress. Look what Esther said. Go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, we'll go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. When do you fast? When you're about to go on a suicide mission. When you're... You're about to yell Geronimo and jump into the fray because somebody needs to do something and you don't know how it's you don't know how you're going to win and it doesn't look good but you're going for it. She fasted and prayed for three days and then she walked into the presence of the king and risked her life. In times of distress, in times when you need some courage. In times when you're about to do something big, you're about to throw down, spiritually speaking. That's when you fast and you pray. Mourning or memorial. Esther, to establish these days of Purim at the designated times, Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had decreed for them. They had established themselves and their descendants in regard to the times of fasting. And lamentation. Now Purim is involved in some sort of, I don't know, Jewish version of costume Halloween day, but Purim originally was a time to fast and lament. And a time uh, to uh, remember God's deliverance. Sometimes we would fast to lament the loss of people or a sad situation. Maybe you lost a loved one on a certain day and you grieve their loss. Maybe that's a day that you should spend calibrating. Maybe the anniversary of the loss of that loved one that's torn you apart and it's dominated your days and it's made your life hard to go on. Maybe on the memorial day of their passing, maybe you should fast and pray on that day and ask for God to deliver you from the sorrow and help you move on with your life and serve Him with joy. There's a time to lament. There's a time to rejoice, but there's a time to cry. And there's a time to fast in memorial. To remember. Maybe you were in the war. You lost a bunch of buddies on a certain day. Maybe you want to remember or honor somebody. Maybe you had a time in your life of where God really delivered you and saved you, and you don't want to forget that day. And each year you want to go back and you want to fast and pray on that day and realign your mind and your heart and your soul. They set that up. You say, Some people say, well, God never gave Mordecai and Esther the authority to create a whole holiday. Read the New Testament. Jesus celebrated it. It was good enough for Jesus. It's good enough for me. You know, I can just see the non-instrumentalists in Jesus' day. (laughs) 
where's the precedent in the biblical command for, for Purim? And Jesus is like, I don't know, I'm celebrating. For the sick. Turns out if something's not forbidden, it's still okay. Anyway, um, for the sick, Psalm 35, 13. When you were sick and ill, I put on sackcloth and humbled myself with fasting. You got a relative who's sick? You're worried about them? Maybe you're sick. Maybe you fast and pray. You got somebody in your church you all really love, and they're going to have a big surgery? They're going to get a big test? They're going to have a big... They, they, they're, they're very ill? What if you fasted and prayed for that person? Samuel, 2 Samuel 12, 16. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went to his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. When his son was sick, he fasted and he prayed. There's a time to fast, and one of those times is when someone's physically sick. And if that's true for physical illness, how much more true for spiritual illness? What if we fasted and prayed for people who are struggling in their spiritual walk with spiritual illness? There's a time to fast, and sometimes it's not for yourself. It's for others. When you were ill, I put on Seth's cloth. I humbled myself with fasting. For direction in worship, Acts 13.2. While we were worshiping the Lord and fasting... The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. What were they doing? Worshiping and fasting. Now I've seen lots of church, uh, we're going to have a, a singspiration night and then we're going to have a big meal. I've seen lots of worshiping and feasting. <laughs> but not a lot of worshiping and fasting. There's a time for both. Nothing wrong with getting together and having a good meal. Nothing wrong with that. Amen, hallelujah. But there's also a time for fasting. Notice the church were fasting together. Nothing wrong with a group setting up and saying, hey, let's, let's declare a fast for this period of time. They were worshiping and fasting. Why? They're seeking God's direction. God, what do you want us to do? We worship you, we praise you. We, 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 see, we want your will. Show us what to do. And the Holy Spirit, through the prophet, he's like, set apart Barnabas and Saul. But Lord, that's our lead minister and one of our main preachers. It's our two best teachers. Now, I know we got seven, but that's our favorite too. Set apart Saul and Barnabas. Woohoo! And they set him apart and sent him out. Maybe your church isn't accomplishing its mission, isn't sending out leaders, and isn't multiplying the church abroad and making an impact because you're never worshiping and fasting and seeking his direction. And saying, God, what's your will for us? What's your direction? Maybe we would be Recruiting more leaders, training more people, setting more people apart. If we were fasting and worshiping and asking and seeking his direction. We well, restore our New Testament Christianity. How many Christian churches, churches of Christ do you know that have a worship time and fasting time to seek his direction for the future direction of the church? That's something they did. That's something that God blessed. There's a time for fasting, and one of the times is for direction in your worship and for God to show you what to do. Or to seek a specific blessing. You want a particular blessing from God. Daniel, so I turned to the Lord and I pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting, in sackcloth, in ashes. He wanted God to hear him, and so he... You know, he wants to know, how do I, you know, how do I handle this situation? He seeks God in prayer and fasting. Ezra, thereby, have a canal, I proclaim to fast, so that we might humble ourselves before God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. They're about to go on a big journey, 
and we're all going back to the promised land. woo -hoo! Hey, before we go, though, let's fast and pray. Let's make this journey a little bit better than when the Israelites went into the promised land the first time, where they went with complaining and whining and grumping because we don't got any food or water. This time, they didn't complain or gripe. They rejoiced, and they sought God's direction, and they fasted and prayed. Ezra 8, 23. So we fasted, and we petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayers. Is anybody besides me keep noticing a phrase with the prayer and fasting? We humbled ourselves. It's an act of humility, isn't it? Of reliance on God, submission. Lord, I'm going to fast and pray and seek your guidance and seek your direction, seek your deliverance, seek your comfort, seek your... Uh, guidance when we fast we are demonstrating in a physical sense our spiritual dependence on god and we do it to seek a specific blessing uh look at acts 13 3 so after they had fasted and prayed they placed their hands on them and sent them off <laughs> they wanted paul and barnabas to be blessed in the missionary journey holy spirit says Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul. They're like, yes, Lord. And so they fasted. And when they were done fasting, they laid their hands on him. God bless them. See you, boys. They gave him some money and sent him out. Seek God's blessing. Now, they went out and they had their missionary journey. They go on the first missionary journey. They planted a bunch of churches. They go back. They report what they did. Now it's time to go back. Let's go check on the church. So they go back to check on the churches, and when they go back, it had been a few years, and they would grown some leadership, so they want to put in some elders uh, in the churches. So Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting, committed them to the Lord in whom they'd put their trust. Question. How many of you have ever seen elders ordained? Elders put into place. Okay, raise your hand if your church prayed and fasted before they ordained them. We got one person. Prayer and fasting should come as we're seeking for leaders and as we put leaders into position. It's a repeated event. It's not a one-time thing that they did. There's a pattern of behavior. That seeking God's leaders and ordaining and putting into place God's leaders was accompanied by prayer and fasting. I re I'm on firm conviction that when we seek and install leaders, before we do, there should be prayer and fasting. What if before we made big decisions, there was prayer and fasting? Imagine for a minute with me, with Joshua and the people of Israel, all excited, they got into the promised land, they're, they're uh, destroying cities, they're conquering the place, and remember the spies came and acted like they were from far away, but they're from nearby? And said, hey, we want to make a deal with you. What if they'd said, okay, that's cool. You want to make a deal? Before we do, we've got to fast and pray and ask God about that. They wouldn't have been deceived, would they? What did Paul tell Timothy? Do not be quick to lay hands on anyone. No hurrying people into leaders. Well, we need elders. What do we do if we don't have elders? We need elders. They went for years without elders before Paul and Barnabas came back. You don't got to have an elder. If you don't have qualified men, it's better to have no elders than unqualified elders. In fact, in a lot of churches in America right now, one of the best things you could do is if there was no elders in those churches because those elders aren't shepherding and they're not qualified and they shouldn't be there. Nobody prayed and fasted and sought God's direction. They were just thrown in there. So we need elders. We seek God's blessing with prayer and fasting. Those are the situations where you fast and pray. You don't fast because, well, I'm going to fast ever so often. There was a guy I knew who, in the Bible who fasted once a week. 
and he went away unjustified. <laughs> it did him no good. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But fasting isn't so, well, it's fast time. Well, it's, it, you know, it's Ash Wednesday, better fast. Give something up for Lent. Fasting isn't about, well, ever so often, let's just do it. Fasting should have a reason. It seems to me, when I'm in the Bible and I read about fasting, something's going down and they want to show their earnestness in seeking God's direction, blessing, forgiveness, healing, protection, whatever. It seems to me fasting was something they did when they sensed big stuff's going on and we need to really draw close to God. We really need to set aside earthly physical distraction and set our minds and our, our, our hearts fully on God. It seemed to me the fasting was something that happened in those circumstances, which are not infrequent. Seeking God's direction is infrequent. Worshiping, say, God, lead us, that's not infrequent. Putting in leaders, that's not infrequent. Repenting isn't infrequent. It's a regular thing that we should be doing, but it was more situational than, what day is it? It's fasting. Oh, Ramadan's coming up. It's time to fast. We can't eat up from sundown, sun up to sundown. But after sundown, we're picking out. We're going to Ryan's Steak. You know, we're going to you know, the Golden Heifer, uh, Golden Crow, whatever. Uh, we're going to... We're going to go there. I love going to the Golden Corral. I'm not going to lie, though. Because the thing I like about going to the Golden Corral, it's one of the only places I can go where I'm one of the skinniest guys in the place. Yeah. You know, I just love that. <laughs> one of the things I love, they, I love the Golden Corral. And their steak's not bad, and I love that bourbon chick. Um, so when does fasting work? Next question. And kind of when does it not work? I got five minutes to start this. We'll have to finish it a little later. Isaiah 58, 3 through 11. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? They're like, God, we fasted and you haven't done nothing. <laughs> Why have we fasted and you've not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. You exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife. I tell you what, if you're not fasting for spiritual reasons and with a sincere heart, you're just going to get hangry. You know, like those Snickers commercials. It ends in quarreling and strife with striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to break every yoke? There's no value in a national day of prayer and fasting or whatever while we're going to go kill babies. There's no point in fasting and praying and asking for God's blessing at your church if you're going to argue and fight with one another and be selfish. If you're going to lord it over one another and enslave one another and boss each other around and fight with one another and argue at your church there's no point in fasting and seeking God's blessing. Because you're a poser. You're an actor. You're a hypocrite. You're a thespian. You're fake. You're doing it for optics, not for reality. You ever see somebody donate money to a place and they'll have a huge check, like the size of this? That's not about helping out the individual. That's about showing off that they're giving money. That's not generosity. 
that's advertising. I guarantee you that money came from an advertising budget. Not from the philanthropic goodness of the heart of the corporation. Some things are done to be seen. Or done because it's something religious to do, right? Like the guys in World War II were sitting around in a bunker and the Japanese started shelling them and they got afraid and they said, we're going to die, we ought to do something religious. So one of them took off his helmet and they passed around and took up an offering. Didn't know what to do with the offering, but they took one up. They did something spiritual. And I don't want you to fast because, well, we ought to, we, we got to do something spiritual. Look, fasting without really repenting is pointless. If you're still going to fight and abuse each other and be selfish and push each other around and shackle each other and treat each other without kindness and love and grace and goodness, if you're going to lord it over one another, then there's no point in fasting. You're just wasting your time. How many times does God tell them, I don't want your, your sacrifices. Oh, that you would shut the doors of the temple. He said, yeah, I'm sick of your, you know, I really feel like God's like, I wish that church would just shut down. I wish they'd stop taking communion. It's an embarrassment to me that they're taking communion and then fighting with each other over petty stuff. Arguing with each other, not getting along with each other, and hurting each other over what? Their traditions, their opinions. With no interest in doing what God wants, repenting of sin, loving their fellow man, or winning the lost. It's, am I comfortable when I go to church? This is a hospice. I'm trying to die quietly here. Leave me alone. That's not real fasting. Real fasting is about this sincere seeking of God. And if it's not coming from here, if there's, if there's not weeping, if there's not sorrow, if there's not earnest seeking for direction, if there's not a willingness to follow after God's will, even if that means some God calls us to do something we don't want to do or we didn't want to happen, if there's not a giving up of sin, if there's not a setting people free and, and untying the yoke, if it's not about going and setting people free from sin and from Satan, if it's not about winning souls and setting the captive free, it's not biblical fasting. You can still do it intermittently for your health if you want. You can still do it for the health benefits. But don't expect it to have any spiritual consequence and be anything but an abomination and an annoyance to God Almighty. Because it has to be real. Fasting is a passionate expression of desire to seek God in a moment of need. It's a humbling yourself before the Lord so that He can lift you up. And you can't humble yourself before the Lord while you're punching your fellow human in the face, metaphorically speaking. Or, worse, while you're stabbing each other in the back. At least people who punch in the face have the kindness to do it in front of you. <laughs> that kind of fasting doesn't work. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and at 5 after we will come back and finish our fasting conversation. So go ahead.